In 1967, the German car firm NSU released the Row 80. Equipped with four-wheel disc brakes, a semi-automatic gearbox, and a peculiar clutch which was actuated by pressing down on the gear knob, the Row 80 was believed to be ahead of its time, though its features are quirky by modern standards. It was even fitted with a warning buzzer to alert the driver that the 9000 RPM redline was approaching. With agile handling and a quiet and smooth engine, the Row 80 was voted Car of the Year in 1968. But what truly made the Row 80 unique was its 84 kilowatt or 113 brake horsepower, 995 cc twin rotor Wankel engine. For the time, the new engine design was regarded as a technologically advanced power plant. Leading up to the release of the Row 80, the advent of the Wankel rotary engine was considered the next big leap in engine design amongst automakers. Spearheading its introduction was the joint partnership between NSU and Curtis Wright, a US-based diversified product and service manufacturer. The NSU and Curtis Wright venture led to license agreements for developing the engine for American, German, and Japanese car manufacturers. Its initial attraction to automakers was the Wankel's smooth, quiet, and uncomplicated design. It positioned itself as a promising power unit for upcoming models. Back in the United States, American Motors Corporation, or AMC, was convinced that the Wankel engine would play an important role as a power plant for cars and trucks in the future, eventually replacing the internal combustion engine within a decade. So much so that the AMC Pacer was designed originally for the rotary engine in which units were supposed to be purchased from Curtis Wright. But later, AMC decided instead to purchase the engines from General Motors, who were developing them for use in their own cars. General Motors later canceled development of their rotary engine, leaving AMC to find an alternative for the Pacer. GM's cancellation was primarily attributed to policy changes caused by the 1973 oil crisis. Thereafter, consumer awareness placed a greater emphasis on fuel economy. Proposed U.S. emissions legislation and minimum fuel economy standard further frustrated any uptake of the rotary engine for American automakers. Despite its eventual demise, the rotary engine possessed an upper hand over the piston engine layout in a few regards. Let's explore the inspiration and mechanics of a rotary engine and its notable differences over a traditional engine. The inspiration for the rotary engine was derived from the geometric principle that when a circle is rolled on its own circumference along another circle that has double the radius, a point within the circle generates a curve known as an epitrochoid. This curve forms the shape of the inner walls of the rotor housing. The rotor housing hosts all stages of the rotary's power stroke, much like a cylinder bore in a conventional engine. As for the shape of the rotor, a triangle was ideal because it yielded the most effective configuration within the housing. As the three apexes of the triangular shaped rotor move uniformly along the inside walls of the rotor housing, the cavity between the rotor and the interior walls of the housing are divided into three continually changing areas of volume. This is because rotary engines are variable volume progressing cavity systems. As each rotor has three faces and each face has three cavities of volume per housing, in effect, each face of the rotor sweeps its own volume as the rotor moves in an eccentric orbit within its housing. Each side of the rotor is brought closer to and then further away from the wall of the internal housing, compressing and expanding the combustion chamber. A rotor is effectively akin to a piston, but where the cylinder volume changes as the piston travels up and down in a cylinder, the volume, configuration, and position of the operating cavity changes as the rotor orbits in an eccentric fashion. Generally, a reciprocating piston engine requires valves for the air-fuel intake and exhaust cycles. The air and fuel mixture is introduced through the intake port when the intake valve opens. This happens while the piston begins the intake stroke. When the intake valve closes and the piston is brought upward, the gas is then compressed. As the spark plug ignites, the piston is forced downward by the combustion. The exhaust valve then opens and burnt gas is forced out by the rising piston. Air and fuel are brought in again and the cycle is repeated. It's easily observed that while the crankshaft turns twice, the explosion occurs only once. On the other hand, the rotary engine has no valves. Instead, the rotor itself behaves like a valve as it orbits. Air and fuel is introduced through the intake port located on the side of the housing, previously closed off by the rotor. 
When the volume of the operating chamber reaches its maximum, the intake port is closed off again by the orbiting rotor. The gas is then compressed as the chamber reduces in volume. The spark plug ignites, combusting the air and fuel mixture. The power vector of the combustion goes through the center of the offset rotor, advancing its orbit. When the rotor reaches the position of maximum volume, the exhaust port is uncovered and the spent gas is expelled as the chamber contracts. The process is then repeated. Since the rotor has three faces, the same process is repeated continuously. Let's take a closer look as to what this means exactly. When side A is about to be propelled by the exploding gas, side B is in the intake and compression phase. While this is happening, side C is in the exhaust phase. When the rotor moves, side A goes into the exhaust phase, and then side B begins expanding. Side C begins the intake and compression phase. This inherent orbital layout of a rotor underscores a stark design difference to the reciprocating motion of a piston. In contrast to an engine that employs pistons, the Wankel rotary engine delivers low swept volume from a lightweight, simple, and compact design. These advantages make it a prime application for automobiles, motorcycles, race cars, and aircraft because of the power to weight it can offer. To better comprehend how this was done, let's first define swept volume. Swept volume is the displacement of one cylinder between top dead center and bottom dead center. Once we have the swept volume, we can work out the displacement of an engine. In the case of a conventional engine, the piston would sweep its volume as it travels from top dead center to bottom dead center. Calculating the displacement with this arrangement would factor in the number of cylinders times the swept volume of one cylinder. Conversely, calculating the swept volume for a rotary engine replaces the number of cylinders with the number of rotors. As an example, Mazda rates their 13B rotary engine at 1.3 liters. Each phase of a single rotor has a swept displacement of 654 cc or 0.65 liters. This is then multiplied by the quantity of rotors, in this case 2, resulting in 1.3 liters. Be that as it may, using this calculation as a relatable number to compare a 4-cycle engine to a rotary engine is not optimal. The number of rotors alone is not enough. If we are going to use the number of cylinders versus the number of rotors, we would instead need to factor in the three faces of each rotor as well, and how many faces complete a thermodynamic cycle within a certain number of degrees. Let us first define a thermodynamic cycle which is a sequence of actions that involve the transfer of heat into and out of a contained system, and the changing pressure, temperature, and other variables that eventually return the system to its initial state. Though the stages of a thermodynamic cycle are the intake, compression, combustion, and exhaust strokes, our primary consideration will be on the completion of an entire thermodynamic cycle. In a piston engine, the crankshaft is directly tied to the reciprocating motion of the piston, one thermodynamic cycle equates to two revolutions, or 720 degrees of the crankshaft of the four-cycle engine. On the other hand, a rotary engine's crankshaft rotates three times faster than that of the rotor. Because of this unique gearing, and because a rotor has three faces, each offsetting face is in a different stage within its respective thermodynamic cycle as the rotor orbits. The implication is that a rotor's face will be brought through the stages of its respective thermodynamic cycle more frequently than a piston, in such that the completion of an entire thermodynamic cycle occurs twice as frequently as a piston, or at a 2 to 1 ratio. So when the piston completes its entire thermodynamic cycle at 720 degrees, a rotor's face has completed it twice. As a result of this perceived advantage, some racing series have even banned the rotary altogether. Many regulatory bodies in automotive racing have variously considered rotary engines to have the equivalence of a reciprocating four-stroke piston engine of one and a half to two times the displacement of one cavity per rotor. Contributing to this is that the rotor travels one-third the speed of its crankshaft. Its output shaft subsequently travels faster than that of the rotor's oscillating parts. When coupled with the inherent smoothness of a rotary cyclical motion and the lack of stress put on its eccentric shaft, Rotary engines are capable of operating at high engine RPMs. In fact, they are commonly operated above 10,000 RPMs in racing applications, and even conservatively between 6,500 to 7,500 RPMs in aircrafts. But in order to maintain these high RPMs efficiently, 
Rotary engines require proper sealing between the rotor's apex and the interior walls of the rotor housing. The three apex seals found on each rotor are pushed against the inner walls of the housing by springs. This ensures adequate compression in each cavity as the rotor orbits through the stages of its thermodynamic cycle. Apex seals are the only moving parts that come in direct contact with the walls of the rotor castings. For purposes of minimizing friction, the inward walls of the castings are usually lubricated in engine oil. This is strikingly dissimilar to a traditional engine, where oil is squirted up under the pistons. However, this is by design, by way of a throttle control oil meter pump. As the driver depresses the throttle, more oil will be squirted into the rotor housing, thus burning more oil. As a consequence, this has contributed to an erroneous perception that rotary engines burn oil because they are substandard engines. Since this is clearly by design, the use of synthetic oils are not suitable for rotary applications because of their indisposition to burn. Using synthetic oils will lead to deposits and varnishes inside the housing walls, eventually damaging the apex seals. Early versions of the apex seals were constructed from various materials, but eventually proved to be inefficient. This is due in part from irregular thermal distribution, an inherent predisposition in the rotary design. The rotary housing would constantly be heated on one side and cooled on the other as the orbiting rotor completes each stage of the thermodynamic cycle. The high localized temperatures cause distortion, loss of sealing and compression, rendering the apex seals ineffective as they skim the walls of the housing. Subsequently, the rotor housing endures unequal thermal expansion. The apex seals would suffer from asymmetrical wear between the seals themselves and the rotor wall housing as a consequence, which allowed fuel, oil, and combustion gases to escape during the rotor's thermodynamic cycle. Adding to the complication, a moving combustion chamber as on a rotor also means that each fuel charge is still burning when it gets fired down the exhaust, meaning wasted energy, increased fuel consumption, and dirty emissions. Conversely, these thermal inefficiencies are not as ubiquitous on a reciprocating piston engine. A piston is heated by the combustion episode and then cooled by the incoming charge, which is the reason why apex seals are not as durable as piston rings used on a conventional engine. This placed a greater demand on the materials used to construct apex seals, especially after the row 80's end, which was attributed to poorly designed apex seals, eventually bankrupting NSU. The simplicity of the rotary's design made it easier to experiment with alternative materials which Mazda researched extensively. The choice of materials evolved from carbon alloys, steel, ferretic, and other materials. The largest hurdle that had to be overcome was the chatter marks left on the rotor housing sliding surfaces. Frictional vibrations of the apex seals caused this issue and were dubbed devil's nail marks. The first breakthrough for Mazda to solve the chatter mark issue was the use of cast iron cross hollow seals, but were found to be complex and expensive to manufacture. Later, single piece aluminum impregnated carbon seals which were developed jointly by Mazda and Nihon Carbon were used. These seals used Nihon's pyrographite high strength carbon compound. Afterwards, a two piece cast iron seal with triangular corner pieces was then used to remedy the frictional vibration issue. By the 1980s, the apex seal progressed into a three piece configuration where the main seal was divided laterally and at an angle but still retaining the triangular corner pieces. This last version carried over well into the 2002 Renesis engine. By this point, Mazda had released a slew of models like the Cosmo, RX-3, and three generations of the iconic Mazda RX-7. Since early rotary engines lacked low-end torque, the RX-7 FD was equipped with the legendary 13B REW, which came with sequential twin turbochargers. One to provide 10 psi of boost from 1,800 RPM, and the second activated in the upper half of the RPM range to maintain 10 psi until redline. The 13B's compact design produced significant power relative to its small proportion, giving the RX-7 amazing power to weight in an already lightweight chassis. For this reason, the 13B has been praised as a competitive engine in motorsports in spite of its inability as a power plant for daily use. In 1991, Mazda won the 24 Hours of Le Mans under the Group C-Class with its 13B-powered RX-7 under the hood. Mazda created history with its winning car, 
which became the first Japanese car and the first without pistons to win at Le Mans. The RX-8 eventually became the spiritual successor to the RX-7 FD, with its release in 2003 in the United States. Instead of relying on turbos used in the previous generations, the RX-8 produced 200 naturally aspirated wheel horsepower, but to reach its maximum power output, it needed to be kept in the high RPM range. The largest improvement in the Renesis engine was the two exhaust ports per rotor in the side housing, instead of one peripheral exhaust port for each chamber found on the 13B. This reduced gas flow resistance, eliminating the intake exhaust overlap, and increases thermal efficiency, power, and fuel efficiency. Unlike the previous engines, the unburned gases are not carried into the next combustion episode. In order to meet emissions guidelines, the RX-8 limited the amount of oil injected into the engine in comparison to the engines found in the previous models. Though this resulted in additional heat and friction, which shortened the lifespan of apex seals, thus reducing the average lifespan of the Renesis engine to 96,000 kilometers or 60,000 miles. In face of the early success and the later cult following of the RX-7 and the eventual release of the RX-8, the rotary engine was dropped by Mazda and further interest as a competitive power unit was concluded.